Welcome back, folks, to BVE 2015. I've got old friend and comrade, Philip Bloom, on the couch. Hello, Philip. Uh, Philip's here to tell us a bit about his seminar, which is all about the project you've just been working on. Yeah, it's a show called The Wonderlist, and made it for CNN. It's one of their original series, and they've been making them for about two or three years now, the actual original shows. They don't just make news, but um, they've all been outsourced, production companies. It's the first one they've done in-house. And they've still got people like myself being brought in to do it. And it's been an incredible journey since I started working on it in July last year. Uh, it's um, it's a, a global doc series uh, going to places around the world which are amazing for whatever reason, but are on the, uh, the, the brink of change. So when I say change for the good, maybe depending on how you perceive things. Uh, also the environmental change type stuff is not always going to be for the good at all. But there's other things like we went to a um, place in uh, on the Greek islands called Ikaria, which is the largest concentration of over 100s who live there. And it's, you know, it's amazing seeing why and how they, they're living so much, so much longer than anybody else. But it's changing because their children are dying before them. So it's, you know, it's modern life is changing and affecting them. And then we go to places like um, Venice, and of course, Venice has issues with the rising seawater, and it's a huge issue. It's flooding constantly, and it's getting worse. And then we went, to, uh, the most amazing place we went to was, we did the Galapagos, which was incredible, but Vanuatu in the South Pacific used to be called the um, New Hebrides, uh, three and a half hours off of Australia, and it was incredible. That place was incredible, it was paradise. And a lot of, it, a lot of people have done stuff out there in the past because it's very low lying as well, and you think that's what we're there for, but we're not. It's because money's coming in there. And so they're being tempted by money. And they have this paradise, but you know, they want what you and I have. They want the phones, the TVs. And you know, we're horrified because we see this as a paradise. But they, and it's, it's fascinating. So it's a really diverse series, and it's been a hell of a journey. And presumably very challenging with shooting environments, access, power. Mm. How did you go about capturing it? What kind of technology did you use to, to get the look you wanted? When they approached me, they didn't know really what they wanted. Apart, I mean, Bill, the, the presenter, Bill Weir, uh, been following my work for a while, and um, you know, they, they use C300s and C100s for their feature type stuff within the actual channel. And so, I mean, this is what they initially mentioned, and they just basically, what, what do you think? And then I came up with you know, a, a, a mood board and a bit of an edit of things I thought we could try. And one of the things they were fascinated was with drones and uh, slow motion. And they wanted Super 35, of course. So you know, I put together an idea of things, and it ended up becoming quite a mountain of gear. Um, so it's my own fault. It, it would have been easy just to shoot on a C300, which is a lovely documentary camera, and just have that. Of course, you won't have slow motion or anything else, but you have lovely things. We ended up with F55, which then became the FS7 for mostly power issues, actually, um, because it's a lot less hungry on power and it could use a little batteries. Um, A7S was used a huge amount, and I had it on the Movi. I had two of them. One of them handheld on a tripod for second camera or third camera, and then the other was lived on a Movi M5. And a C100, one of the CNN ones, so the producer was shooting as well for B camera. And so, yeah, all of that, plus monitors, tripods, um, a huge mountain of gear. And interestingly, you know, for people who follow your work, um, they might assume because you're Philip Bloom off the internet that you have an entourage of people helping you. Mm. But this was mostly a one-by-man shoot, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, every, it was, it was mostly four of us uh, were going out there. Uh, three of them from New York and then me. So I was always meeting people there. So I would check in at Heathrow with six bags to check, you know, two to carry, mountain of stuff and eventually get to wherever they are. And then I would have all the stuff in my room. I'd be charging everything, offloading everything, doing everything. I mean, they'd help carry stuff. So yeah, it was, it was hard work for sure. It's, you know, I did get an assistant uh, to help out on the last two shoots, which made an enormous mm. amount of difference. Just, just being able to just get somebody else to look after the batteries to charge those was helpful. Having somebody to set up Movi, because you know, I'd be doing something on the F55 or the FS7, and I know I want to do a Movi shot. And a Movi, you can't just have put away in a bag. Um, so say to the assistant, say, I need to, can you get the Movi ready? Um, I'm going to need that in five minutes, is wonderful. And were you using, sort of, did you get to a system where you had a specific lens on the Movi that you knew you could just pick up and run with? Yeah, and Mo one, the Movi, once I, I got it nailed down, it was the Sony FE Zeiss lens, the 1635. 
in auto uh, focus mode. And on a wide angle, it worked actually really well. Um, really, really well. And auto ISO. And I used auto, I never normally use auto for anything, but it worked really well. And you set it in, it's such a smooth transition. You don't always want it. Sometimes, you know, you, st you stick it for a set ISO, but for those ch changing lighting conditions, it was wonderful. Yeah. And you can set the parameters in the camera, you know, don't go past this level. The joy of this camera is, it's, as you know, it's great at high ISOs. And if there's light, it's really great at high ISO, so you can stop down. So it's able to stop down and get a nice deep depth of field at F8 and be comfortable with ISO 8000. Yeah. It's wonderful. And it's interesting because you know, you've got all this technology and all the powering issues, but fundamentally as an artist, you want to still be capturing the essence of the scene. How hard is that to manage, especially on your own, you know, managing all the power and logistics of getting the gear wired up and connected to location, and then presumably you've still got a tight, tight shoot schedule? Yeah, I mean the biggest issue when you've got all this stuff is you are not thinking too, as, uh, at the end of the day, I really want to be going through what we've done and talk about the next day, but I am offloading a lot of data, I'm making sure everything's charged, I'm cleaning the gear, because we're filming on beaches and at sea, you know, so much to do, and not able to concentrate and figure out what the next day is until that morning. I want to be prepared, I want to know what we're doing, I want to have that, you know, you want that involvement, with, we have that very tight involvement, but it was, it was too much and I was probably averaging uh, around three hours sleep a night on every shoot. Because at the end of every shoot day, as you say, you talk about cleaning the gear, charging the batteries. You've got to offload all the in. Talk, talk me about your, your backup and archive strategy on location. Yeah, so backup and archive, as you know, is essential. The old days of recording it onto uh, one tape. Uh, yeah. The good old days of one tape. Yeah. We never did, did you ever do a dupe of a tape on location? <laughs> no, you didn't do that. But uh, so uh, the solution that, that seemed to work well, and it took, uh, a mistake for that to, ha to happen was um, I did all the backups, I did uh, all the copies, I took all the cards of everybody, so I had everything, and I, at night, which is never the ideal time to do it after a long day, is I copied everything onto, my, onto two hard drives. I then had all those cards in a pouch, and I gave them to the field producer, Julian, um, and he offloaded it to his hard drives. He didn't copy my hard drive, he copied the cards, because what's the point of making a, a copy of a mistake? Yeah. So, and then what we would do is we would compare our days and make sure we both had the same amount of data, and then we'd see if we'd missed anything. And it saved us. Yeah. Um, I would miss something, or he would miss something. Yeah. But together, because it's not ideal, you want somebody who isn't tired at the end of the day to be doing it. But you, you, you find ways to make these, work, these things work. Indeed, indeed. So you're doing a seminar today, and then you're off to New York at the weekend, are you? Yeah, uh, so I have the joy of getting from XL to Heathrow. Uh, so that would be fun. Uh, I, have to get to, uh, I have some have some gear with me, so I'm going to have to get a taxi. So the drive should be fun. But yeah, we're flying to New York tonight, last flight out, because the show goes live on Sunday. And there's last minute um, some promotional work that they, w they want me there for. And we're having a party on Sunday night to see the show. Unfortunately, it's not in the UK right now. It's only on CNN America and CNN On Demand because it's being sold internationally. Yep. So I don't know who's going to be sharing it here, sure. but uh, if you're in America and you're watching this, or if you can find some way to and see And people can catch segments on your website, of course. Yeah, we've got segments and we've got loads of BTS, and there's loads of little clips of the show as well on the CNN website. So there's loads of clips out there, and I'm sure that it'll be available online in some So form. if anyone's coming to the show today, what time can they see you and where? 1.30 at the Cinematography Theatre, which is, it's, it's going to be packed, so do come early. Yep. Um, don't come too early because there's somebody talking till 20 past one. Cool. <laughs> Philip, thank you very nice much. Nice seeing you. Right, folks, we'll be back shortly with some more guests.